Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you to Seba Ben Browns. Today's August 22nd, 2023. And we're going to see a series of uh, slide of images uh, that we obtained recently. And what we're going to do is we're going to see it with and without esophageal pressure so that you can start uh, making your skills better at reading these waveforms and also seeing some of the benefits of having the waveform and some of the challenges of having it too. Uh, in terms of disclosures, there's no endorsement of any particular mode manufacturer or company. Whatever we say, it's our opinion. It does not represent the Cleveland Clinic's opinion. Uh, I'm Eduardo Morales and Rob Chatburn, you can see him uh, in the Japanese temple saying hello right now. And we have all the, the, those are our disclosures at this time. Some ground rules, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, this is recorded. And so uh, we may ask you to give us a, to unmute and give us your opinion and your thoughts. Uh, all of those are, are welcome. So use your chat uh, with the function from WebEx that will help us. There are CMEs for CCF providers. And for those of you that are RTs, there are CRCEs that are free, and you just need to put in your name on the chat. And then at the end, uh, you're going to have a little item that Ryan will put in that it's a survey. You fill that up and you get your CRCE, uh, which is what I just mentioned here. And you have to complete this within an hour of finishing uh, this lecture. All righty. So a key seven knowledge uh, here. I know that Rob put in the one of our uh, our articles that we just put in online ahead of free of print is free. This is the QR for it. Uh, but one of the key seven knowledges is to understand that the patient is the reference, and this way wave, this waveform shows this in a way. Uh, on the top waveform you have the esophageal pressure, and on the lower one you have the airway opening pressure. And the, the dashed lines indicate where certain activities started. So one, line number one indicates where the PMOS started, and line number two indicates where the ventilator starts. And you can see there's always a lag, an amount of lag that exists uh, because of the performance of the ventilator and uh, just the distance that the signal has to travel and whatnot. Uh, but there's always gonna be a lag as long as it's not uh, clinically significant, then it's on time. And then you can see also where the PMOS ends, uh, which is at the lowest point of the waveform. And then where the, uh, that's line number three and line number four is where the, the pressure from the ventilator ends. And so by looking at this, you could uh, say, well, the triggers seem to be close enough, that's good. But in terms of cycling, there's a good discrepancy between where the patient effort ended and where the machine breath uh, the ended. And so, uh, the, the, without a doubt, the presence of an esophageal balloon helps uh, you read the waveforms a little bit better when you have it available. But if not, what we use is the flow and the pressure waveforms, depending on what mode we are. So this is just for you to uh, have an idea of what we're looking at as we're going to be going through these waveforms. Rob, comments about these waveforms, please. Oh, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So here we go. Next slide. This is the, uh, the mode. And again, this has been enhanced. This is a uh, Hamilton C6 uh, that we have. The screen looks a little bit more brighter, but that's needed so that you can see the waveforms a little bit better. And as always, we start with the tag. So if you want to challenge yourself uh, and put your, the in the chat message here, what do you think is the tag for this uh, ventilator mode? And you can see that up on top, I put the mode so that you could see it uh, clearly. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a look at it. Very good. So there is a, a good amount of, of homogeneity on, on, the, on the group, uh, recognizing this is pressure control. 
And that means that, uh, as you may remember, that you can only either control the pressure or control the flow. And uh, you can see that the pressure looks as a square waveform on all of them. And the, uh, the flow has different morphologies, which uh, usually tends to mean that there's that what is being controlled is the pressure, not the not the flow. So in this case, it's pressure control. Uh, then all of you said that this was uh, CMB, uh, meaning continuous mandatory ventilation, meaning that all breaths are mandatory uh, in, in this uh, mode. And that means that either the trigger or the cycle uh, are controlled by the ventilator. And that's what's happening here. In this case, the patient is triggering, or at least we know that by this little triangle here that tells us that the signal from the patient is triggering. But it's cycled by time, and you can see that it's cycled by time because it's the same inspiratory time for all the breaths. What, uh, that's what it ma matters here. And then many of you recognized uh, the, the targeting scheme for this uh, in APV CMB in the Hamilton is an adaptive targeting uh, scheme, which means that you set a target tidal volume and the ventilator is going to adjust the pressure, the inspiratory pressure up or down to achieve that target tidal volume. Uh, this is, uh, there's many names for this mode in each one of the ventilators uses different names, but it's the PRVC or VC plus or volume guarantee that exists in other ventilators. Rob, comments? Well, just to reiterate that uh, you can't tell by looking at the waveform that this is adaptive. You can tell from the name because it's adaptive pressure ventilation, but more specifically, like you pointed out on the right, those are the ventilator control settings. So you set a tidal volume and pressure control that can only mean adaptive targeting. Excellent. And, and, and that's correct. The uh, perfect, perfect, perfect comment, uh, stating that it's. Just by looking at the waveform, you cannot. And actually, that will happen with many modes. Uh, in the absence of, uh, if you have a patient paralyzed uh, or with or deeply sedated, the the waveforms will be very difficult to recognize what are the targeting schemes in many or the or the breath sequences in the absence of patient effort. So uh, that's what the the importance of using uh, knowing the tag of the mode that you're using. Alrighty. The next question is, what is the load? Is it elastic, resistive, or is this being hidden by the presence of PMOS? And so let's start with inspiration. Enter in the chat what you think is the main load for this patient during inspiration. And uh, here you can see that the inspiratory time in this patient is around a second um, for each one of the, of the breaths. And have no fear. This is a environment for us to learn and, and get more information and get better at what we do. All right, so I see a, a good amount of, of uh, both uh, resistance, elastance and PMO. So we have a good good balance of one of each, that's great. So during inspiration, during that second that we have, we actually see one waveform doesn't reach the end and it cycles. The next one, there is uh, some curvature that moves up that tells us that there is the presence of PMOS. And actually you can see that the flow ended much lower uh, on this one compared to, to this one. And then in the last one, the flow is even more higher than the, than the other one. So there is a, a, a combination of different heights on the on the waveform on each one of them. They are not all of them finishing at the same time. So uh, you could make the argument that uh, this would be the expected type of waveform that you would see in somebody with high resistance during inspiration. But because there's different flows on each one of them, this makes me think, at least at this time, that there may be a high com a component of the presence of PMOS but I would leave there a little bit of resistance, if anything. Rob? I agree. All right. And during, during exp expiration, you have, uh, the, the let's focus on the breaths that we can see. And on the first one, you see that the patient got the breath and then rapidly uh, 
got to baseline, uh, but it's not an exponential decay. It seems a little bit more straight, and then it crosses over ba the, the base, and then it triggers a breath. But on the next one, it does take an amount of time for the patient to get there. And I would say it's one, two, two and a half seconds, which increases the suspicion that there is an increased resistance on, on this patient. So I would say there's a presence of, of PMOS during inspiration with uh, some resistance during, uh, in general for physiology, because th these two present at the same time. Rob? We're good. All right. So now it's time for the patient ventilator. And I'm gonna show you now this waveform, we're gonna comment this one, and then we're gonna show the same one several times, uh, not the same waveform, but the same case uh, for you to, to be able to take a look and come to terms with what we are seeing, okay? So if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate in, in putting them in the chat. So let's start with the patient ventilator discordance. So in terms of trigger, is it normal, early, late, false, or failed? And I'm going to uh, focus you on these waveforms that you have here, starting from uh, the, the waveform two, uh, three, and, and the th what, sorry, one, two, and three. So is the, is the trigger normal? Is there any evidence of early, late, false, or failed? Just put in the in the chat. Have no fear. Yeah, there's a late uh, trigger in one of them. Okay, good. Keep going. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of. That's pretty good. We're seeing a lot of love here. All right. So let's start with uh, breath number one. And on breath number one, I remember this little triangle here means that the patient triggered and the color actually is codified to what is the type of trigger that it's going on. And so in breath number one, it's, it's uh, what color is this? Pink, because it's flow triggered, okay? When it's pressure triggered, it should be yellow. And when this ventilator has a funky new uh, way of of triggering, uh, which is called IntelliSync. And if it's blue, then it is, it's IntelliSync. So in this case, it's flow triggered. So this one, uh, it seems that there's the signal for trigger. There's perhaps a little bit of a dec decay, but on the pressure here, and then the flow, the pressure goes up. The flow is at the baseline throughout. It doesn't seem to cross it. So I would say that this is normal. Rob? Yep. So, so breath number one is normal. Now, breath number two, we actually, so, so Linda told us, you know, Eduardo, I think that this is late. And actually, you can see how it's crossing the baseline. You see that it crosses uh, the, the, the baseline and then uh, it triggers. So from a standpoint, this seems to be a late trigger that there was PMOS occurring earlier on at least by, by, by the flow. So I would say that breath number two is late. Uh, so I would stand with Linda on this one. And then breath number three, there's all these little oscillations that you see here, and then it seems to cross the baseline and then it triggers. So if anything late to, to normal, I would say uh, for that, that, that breath. So I would put this one uh, probably here, uh, three. Rob? Disagreement, anger management? No, the second one, you can actually see PMUS happening during the expiratory phase. Because you see an abrupt change in the slope That's on the, the other one, that one, that one. The, the, right there with the abrupt change in the flow. That's when probably where PMUS started, way back there. Exactly. So there's a change in the slope of the flow. Yep. That's how you determine it. And then breath number three. Um, Someone could argue that those oscillations might have been caused by a cardiac, uh, and it could have been a false trigger, right? All right. So let's put here. There's okay. a there, there's a concern, and actually I see there that there's a fail amount of uh, of of concern for failed or not failed. There's some failed, but it could be uh, false or failed. Uh, it depends uh, what you had. Then during inspiration, we saw that there's evidence of some. Uh, work uh, by the patient, uh, by, the, the, uh, by, by the patient, the tidal volume, there is no major discrepancy here. So I'm going to say that this is 
probably close to normal, Rob. And I know that we're discussing whether over assistance, under assistance, but I'm going to leave it for now that it looks relatively normal. In terms of cycle, do you see any evidence of late cycle here in any of these breaths? There is no increase in pressure. There is no pause at the end of this, so it's not late. And what about early amputation of or, or evidence of effort? Not really, right? So I would say this looks relatively normal. And then we talked about some expiratory work on breath number two. So now it's time for me to show how painful reality is when you put a darn catheter in. And uh, this may, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna start seeing a little bit more. Now, one of the problems with this ventilator, and I'm, again, there's no endorsement or, or denial of anything, is that you cannot adjust the gain. This is just a complaint from, my, I, I, I love to be able to adjust the gain. So as you see these waveforms, you're gonna be like, Eduardo, why didn't you adjust the gain? I couldn't. I cannot press the button. All right, so here it goes. So, if I could increase the gain, perhaps we would be able to see a little bit more the changes in esophageal pressure, but I think that it gives you quite an idea of what's happening here. So, here's breath number one, and I'm just amplifying it for you to, to be able to see. Do you see any PMOS? Nada. So this baby over here is a likely a false trigger. So the second breath over here, now this one you can see actually what you saw on the flow, Rob. Uh, this one becomes a little bit better and I put a mark here, but if you follow it down, you can see that it starts dropping the pressure and you can see how the slope changed and it took a while for it to cross and then trigger the breath. So this is definitely a late trigger. Nice, right? And then the last one, let's move it over here. This one over here, it trigger, the, the, it's saying that it triggered there and you can see that the pressure started dropping around here. So this is a normal breath, uh, a normal trigger for, the, for this patient. Okay, isn't that educative? in a lot of ways. So, so you have in the same breath, the three types of breath in this one is a false trigger from cardiac oscillations. And the next one is a late. And in the last one is a normal, uh, normal trigger. All right, but this is the machine that keeps giving. All right, I'm gonna now show you another one. So this is very useful for use to, 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 <laughs> Thank you, Samin. Why didn't you adjust the gain, Eduardo? Because the machine doesn't have that function. Um, all right, here we go again. Now, you, you know the tag is the same patient, is PC, CMBA, and we agreed, and actually now you can see a little bit more that this is mainly a resistive load with some amount of PMAS. And now you have this breath, okay? And you don't see any of those little triangles, right? So these are machine triggered breaths. And, and forget the beginning. I'm sorry I took the picture uh, at a bad time, but it's good enough. So this is a mandatory and this is a mandatory breath, meaning that the, it was triggered by the machine based on the rate that we set. Okay. I'm going to sneeze now. Sorry. All righty. So what type of problem with trigger do we have here? Is it normal, early, late, false, or uh, fail? This is the first breath. I'm putting a one here, and this is the second breath. Just by looking at the waveforms, team. All right, so so I, I'm starting to see some answers come in. Good job, keep going, have no fear. Put your thoughts. This is where you test your your happiness and all righty, excellent. So let's take let's let's analyze this uh, together. So now you can see uh, there's the the noise from the the cardiac oscillations moving there. The first breath starts is mandatory. 
And uh, the flow actually looks different than the other one. The other one has a little bit of a dip, but it goes in. And then look at the expiratory flow. It looks a little bit, if anything, amputated. You see how it does? Normally, you would expect this to have, sorry, that's a terrible line I drew, but you would expect it to have, oh my, a, well, today I'm not going to draw a straight line there like that. It should have a little beak, right? And I don't see that beak anywhere there. It seems to be amputated. So when I see the beak gone, that makes you suspect that there is still inspiratory effort there. So this may be a early trigger. And then on the next one, it becomes even more, more evident, right? So you have, it's a mandatory breath and there is evidence of PMOS with higher flow. And then this event over here, that is definitely evidence of PMOS. There is no question in my book that there is PMOS here. And I will say that I suspect there's PMOS here. So these two would fit the criteria for early, early trigger just based on this amputation here and the presence of uh, this activity here. Disagreement, Roberto. So good. All righty, so let's take, who wants to see the esophageal waveform? All right, here we go. So now you can see, and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger just for the, the sake of us to be able to see it. And so you can see the breath is triggered by the machine. So there's no evidence of PMOS. And then the, P, the esophageal pressure starts dropping and you can see that it reaches its peak around the same time that the end expiratory flow starts. And so this is an early trigger, a clear example. And here it becomes even more evident. The breath starts and there's no activity. And then around number 10, around this point, you can see how the flow increases. You can see the slope changes. And that's when the patient starts doing effort and it continues. And you can see how the, 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 the PMOS, uh, the flow moves towards baseline, which correlates with the esophageal waveform. So these two are good, nice uh, uh, evidence of early triggers. Good. Questions, anger management, so. There was a question uh, about why isn't it early cycle? Yes, that's a great qu question. So one of the things that we realized as we were working a lot more on the taxonomy of uh, of patient ventilator interactions is that if you, the, the, the certain discordances will cause other discordances to appear. So for example, it is common that early trigger will cause under assistance and it will cause early cycle, just like you see it here, or you will see some work shifting. So, the problem is that if you classify those other two, you're going to over classify the type of discordances that exist. So the, the discordance that you do is the first one, even though it may be causing other ones. So if the same PMOS is causing work shifting and early trigger, the only one that you will classify is early trigger. Yes, Sarah, that's exactly correct. So if you correct the early trigger, then it will solve this uh, the early cycle and if it doesn't then you solve your early cycle right so so always treat the first one and that will make you better at the, at it now this i told you this is the tree the the gift that keeps on giving so here comes another one same patient all right so now you have this breath over here, the breath number one, breath number two, and breath number three. And now you have, uh, and all of them are triggered by the pa uh, patient signal. We can see that. We have, this one was triggered by the machine, the, sorry, by the patient. This was triggered by the patient, and this was triggered by the patient according to the machine. And now look at the waveforms. So in the first one, I see already uh, people telling, well, the, the trigger is normal for one, but there is evidence of early cycle, says uh, Victor. So I'm going to put a one over here. For breath number two, 
there is, uh, it's triggered by the machine, sorry, by the patient, and there's, uh, we expect evidence of PMOS, and then there is this amputation, and so again, another early cycle. And then bed three, I took the picture too late, and Ariel is angry at me because I should have waited uh, for the picture to occur. I apologize, but I was so excited to pressing the button. So let's see how this looks, and ta-da! So now you can see, and this is even much nicer, right? You can see it's triggered by, the, the pressure is below, but you can see how long the PMOS went from here all the way over here. And that correlates with what you read as early cycle. On this one, the pressure starts dropping, and then it finishes all the way over here, uh, uh, triggered by early cycle. And this one over here is again a false trigger with uh, evidence of, of uh, activation later on by the patient. So this one is not, uh, this is a false trigger and then, or uh, leading to early trigger. So there you go. So now I hope that this has helped you view the triggering in different ways and how it expresses itself on the flow waveform and how sometimes in some patients, it may be useful to have an esophageal. You don't need to have it on every patient. But when you have it, you can see a lot, a little bit more into the physiology of the of the patient. Rob, comments? Um, just a comment in passing that you notice the bottom graph is transpulmonary pressure, mm -hmm. and that's always positive. So all pressures that inflate the lungs are positive. Transpulmonary pressures and transrespiratory pressures, PMOS. Yeah, so so that's that's wonderful. Uh, I, I, absolutely, I didn't go into into how these look, but there's actually if you go back on the video when we published this on on YouTube, just go back and look at the waveforms and the differences, and and uh, you'll see that when there's PMOS, actually the transpulmonary pressure increases uh, for these these patients. So, which there's good examples on this. Here are the CME for the CCF caregivers. I'm going to answer your question in a second, Ariel. And the CRCs for our RTs, uh, please, uh, there's going to be a link that uh, Ryan will be putting on in, in a second. There you go, just on time. Please send us your waveforms, either through Twitter or directly to our emails. We're happy to read them and actually to present them here. Uh, the, one of the questions that Ariel asked is, well, could, sh should we do an expiratory pause to help us rule out or, com uh, or confirm what or who is triggering? And, and the answer is yes, that, those are, that's one of the, the strategies that you can do for, for this group of patients is to do an end expiratory pause. So meaning that you, uh, the, the ventilator will close, close its valves at the end of expiration. So just before the next inspiration occurs. And then if there's PMOS, you may discover it. Now there's some types of early trigger in which is reflex and you may not see any activity of the PMOS and then you restart the breath and you will see them again. But uh, that's that's a, a, a specific type of, of situation. So uh, let me see if there's any other questions or comments. Mm, I don't see any. And with that, I thank you all. It's 2.30 and hope you all have a great day. Uh, we have, uh, there's a little detail we have uploaded now. All the videos, we're at 54 videos in the YouTube channel. Just go and review. There's a lot of knowledge and things that we have learned through the last 52 sessions. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.